Happy Thanksgiving weekend. I heard that 49 million people or so are traveling in our country this holiday. And probably one of the number one questions that the kids had for their parents when they were sitting in the back of their car was, are we there yet? <laughs> are we there yet? And that's frankly one of the questions that I have had as I've been studying the book of Joshua. Because I keep asking the question, are we there yet? And this morning I'm here to tell you that we're there. We are in Joshua this morning, chapter 6, and we are finally going to come to the conquest of Jericho, this looming city with enormously high walls and certainly uh, a subject of great um, speculation as we've been going through Joshua because we were introduced, if you recall, to Jericho back in Joshua chapter 2 where the spies were sent in by Joshua to go in and check out the city of Jericho. And you remember who they encountered? They encountered a woman by the name of Rahab. Uh, she's known as Rahab the harlot. And they have this opportunity to, to be able to spec out the city and, and check it all out good. But then they were found out, as you recall. And, and it was a very difficult situation. But Rahab hid them from their would-be uh, captors, and they were delivered out the backside of that city, went up into the Judean hillside for about three days before they came back to Joshua to tell Joshua what they noticed in the city of Jericho. So we have been weeks, literally weeks. Aren't you glad it didn't take that long to drive wherever you drove? It's literally been weeks until we've gotten to this point here in Joshua chapter 6. Well, turn in your Bibles there if you would, please. And if you need a Bible, these gentlemen would be pleased to put one in your hand this morning. As we look at the conquest of Jericho and the walls tumbling, tumbling down, there are many lessons for us to be able to learn. I want you to notice as uh, you go to Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, that Josh, Jericho was tightly shut because the sons of Israel... And no one went out, and no one came in. This little map here tends to show us where the people of Israel have been and where they're going. People of Israel, as you notice, were here uh, crossing over the Jordan River, which is this blue line. Adam is that city to the north where you may recall the waters, the Bible says, stood up on a heap as God held them back from going down those 18 miles to an area just to the east of Jericho. And it's there that the people of Israel cross over onto dry ground. You'll notice Gilgal is there. Gilgal is an important little city. Does anybody remember what happened at Gilgal and what Gilgal stood for? Well, I won't ask you to embarrass anybody, but Gilgal, the word literally means what? Circle. And you recall that this was an important notation because when you think of a circle, you may think of rolling, and that was the whole idea here because God appointed Gilgal as a special place when they got across and they put that monument of 12 stones, one stone from each one of, representing one of the tribes. Those stones came from the middle of the Jordan River, and I'm sure they were peculiar. It was a memorial to say this, that the Egyptian reproach has been rolled away. And all the time when people of Israel were there in Egypt, they were uh, servants to the Egyptians, making brick and so forth. While they were there, God was blessing them, and they were, they were amazing in what they were accomplishing. And it wasn't until, though, God takes them out of Egypt. You know the situation with Pharaoh and Moses, and he brings them into the new land, it's not until this point in time where the reproach is rolled away. Before the people of Israel, they've got a job to do now. And uh, the first obstacle that stands in their way is Jericho. Their efforts are going to be in this entire region here, this central part of the promised land. Uh, they're going to be going on to Ai next, and we'll find out about Ai next Sunday when we deal with chapter 7. But here in chapter 6, we find that the strat strategy that God is employing is to go into the central area and cut the main route off 
that extends from the north to the south. Interestingly, back in World War I, there was a British field marshal by the name of Allenby who must have taken note of what happens here in Joshua, and he actually employs the exact same tactic as he liberates Palestine during World War I. It's kind of a fascinating uh, military uh, application that was there. Well, Jericho is a tough spot. The, and the people of Israel are going to need the hand of the Lord because this was a military fortress that is built to defend any type of army that would approach from the east. And it was designed to be able to maintain the integrity of this area in central Palestine. And so we're very aware of that. And no doubt, Joshua is quite aware of that as well. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? And ask God to bless and make his word come alive to us this morning. Father, we come before you today so very thankful for the word of God, knowing, Lord, that the word of God is inerrant, that it is inspired by you, and every single word is to be trusted. Father, help us, Lord, as we open your word to gain knowledge and insight, understanding that you want us to, to have today to live the life that's before us. So encourage us, I pray, today from your word. Help us, Lord, to be blessed in studying it, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Last Sunday when we were meeting together, we talked about the text that uh, is there at the end of chapter 5 where the captain of the Lord's army appears before Joshua. It's actually a Christophany. It's actually Jesus Christ who appeared before Joshua. And he was telling Joshua this. He was basically saying that, listen, Joshua, this is a victory that I'm in charge of. It's not up to you. It's up to me. And it is God who is going to fight then the spiritual battles. We didn't dwell on it last time, but I direct your attention to chapter 6 and verse 2. Chapter 6, verse 2 is an interesting verse where we have the Lord saying to Joshua, and I believe that this is the captain of the Lord's army who is saying this. He says, see, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. Now, when you look at that, you say, well, okay, well, what, what does this mean exactly? God is saying, well, I've done it already. It's already accomplished. This is an interesting uh, uh, way of talking because what God is doing in the Hebrew is he's giving to us, as he mentions, I have given. He says, see, I have given. And those words have given represent a prophetic perfect in the Hebrew, which actually describes a future event as something that has already been accomplished. In other words, there's no question about this victory. It's already a done deal, Joshua. And Joshua, in listening to the Hebrew, would have understood that that is exactly what God is saying. God's not saying this is going to be dicey, that this is going to be a hard struggle, that this fight is 50-50, mm, or better, 75-25, and I think we'll be all right. God is saying to Joshua, this is already a done deal. All you need to do is obey me. All you need to do is follow me. And it's already in the victory column. It's kind of like, it's not your football team today. Now, do the Redskins already play or do they play today? I, I'm not sure. They, they play like every day anymore. It's hard to know which week they're actually playing. But anyway, they might have already won or lost. But the truth of the matter is, if they've already lost, then you know that they lost. But you don't know what the future is. If your team plays today or tomorrow, you may be sitting there and saying, well, I hope we're going to win. We should win, but you don't know if you're going to win. We already know who's going to win when it comes to the Israelites coming against the city of Jericho. God says it's already been accomplished. It's a done deal. It's already set. And what we see here is the plan of God beginning to unfold. And what I want you to do is pick your Bible up and just go with me down through this, um, this, this passage. Because what God says to Joshua is not at all what we would think is going to win the victory. It's not at all making sense. Notice what God says to Joshua. He says, you shall march around the city, verse 3, all the men of the war, all the men of war, circling the city once. And you'll do that for six days, and also seven priests are going to carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And then on the seventh day, 
you'll march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people will shout with a great shout, and the walls of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. Great plan. Now, it's, if God tells you that plan and you're Joshua, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, that, that's that, okay. But now Joshua has to go back to the leaders and tell them the plan. So this is what we're going to do. Wouldn't it make a whole lot more sense to say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to count to three. We're all going to yell, and we're going to attack. And we'll hope for the best. I mean, just run straight to the wall. I mean, that's not how God's doing it, you see. God already has this plan. The victory's already been accomplished. And the challenge now for the people of Israel is to follow the prescription that God lays out for victory. The plan of God is an interesting plan. The plan of God employs the number seven 11 times here. Did you notice that? Over and over and over again. Each day they're supposed to march silently with the priests carrying the trumpets and the, the ram's horns. The city is about eight and a half acres in space, and they're supposed to go around this eight and a half acres once on the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, and sixth day. And on the seventh day, they march around it seven times. And then, after they're through marching around at the seven times, the trumpets will blow, the people will shout, and when the people yell, the walls are going to come falling down. You see, the plan of God is, is an interesting plan. There's some things to note here that I believe are of some significance for us. We all want this to happen. But you'll notice here the priority of silence. Do you see there that the people are instructed by Joshua, picking this up here now in verse 6. Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, let seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. He said to the people, Go forward and march around the city, and let the armed men go on before the Ark of the Lord. And it was so that when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward and blew the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after that, uh, after the ark. And while they continued to blow the trumpets, but Joshua commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or you shall not shout nor let your voice be heard nor let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you. Shout. And then, he says, you'll shout. Well, that was the first thing that is somewhat interesting to me as I'm looking at this plan of God. First thing is, there was a plan for silence. People of Israel, that would be a small miracle, wouldn't it? Just getting them to shut up. That would be a small miracle for me. And that would be a small miracle for you as well, I'm sure. Walking around that city every single day for a week, keeping your mouth shut. I got thinking about that and I thought, you know, the way I understand the scripture is that if I'm following the scripture, I need to follow every little bit of it. In other words, God never gives a command that's kind of optional. Did you ever notice that? And everything has a reason, and oftentimes, I don't really know what the reason is. And for instance, I'm not sure exactly why God said, I want them all to be quiet, but he said, I want you all to be quiet. And I got thinking about that, and I thought, we're all so much better when we're quiet, aren't we? Isn't it true that Exodus 14, 14 says the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent? Isn't it interesting that the psalmist writes in Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. 
Silence is actually a blessing. We live in a world where we're bombarded all the time. We're bombarded by noise. Sound is everywhere. And it almost seems like quiet is nowhere. When you're quiet, as I was thinking about this, and you feel free to disagree because this is just my thought process as I thought about them being quiet. I thought when you're quiet, Kevin, you don't argue with God. You have the opportunity to contemplate and think about what God is doing. Renew your faith in God. When I'm quiet, I also don't make excuses for myself, which I love, by the way, to do. When I'm quiet, I can actually step away from the world and I can think about the things of God. Perhaps the people of Israel were called upon here to stop and be quiet and think about what God was doing. Think about the wonders that lay ahead. At any rate, they were called upon to be quiet. I urge us all to make certain that in our lives there are times of quiet. But we can get alone with God and we can allow God to just simply go through our heart and mind and be able to think about what God is, is doing. Think about the works of the Lord. I also see, in addition to this priority of silence, a very important principle, a principle of obedience. A principle of obedience through faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 30, Hebrews is a phenomenal chapter of scripture, obviously, and it tells us there, and I think I have it somewhere here, in Hebrews, and it should be chapter 11, not chapter 10, but in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. There is an aspect here for the people of Israel as they embraced the plan of God to employ certain faith. They needed to have faith in what God was doing. This is what God was requiring of them. This is why it's written up in the Faith Hall of Fame, as it were, in Hebrews chapter 11. The people of Israel are noted for their faith in God, and it is through their faith in God, by following through with that obedience, that the walls come tumbling down. You see, the victory was right there for them. But they needed to have that faith in a time when they were tempted to walk by sight and not by faith. How often we find ourselves in the same sequence being called upon from the flesh to walk by sight and not by faith. It's difficult, isn't it, to walk by faith? It's difficult to just simply take God's word as it is and say, I'm going to live by this, the word of God. There are going to be unprecedented challenges when you seek to live by faith. Because there are times when God will call you to do certain things that are going to absolutely require faith or you'll never move in that direction. And sometimes these things are small, and sometimes these things are ginormous in our life, but all the while, whether it's small or whether it's huge, it's requiring the same thing. It's requiring faith. There's a principle here, obedience through faith that stands out. And this was needed to come along with following the plan of God. The plan of God also is going to require endurance. And sometimes faith and endurance kind of link side by side. You'll notice in verse 10, Joshua commanded the people saying, you shall not shout, and he goes on and he tells them that. And that's all well and good. And so he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling at once. And then the Bible says, then they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. So, The implication is that perhaps the priests knew what the plan was, but not necessarily all the people. The people would walk around this city one time, and then the Bible says they had to go back to their stuff, back to their camp. So they go back to their camp wondering, no doubt, why did we do that again? 
What was the, what was the exercise there? Why, why did we do that? Okay, we're getting up early in the morning. Get your stuff together. Here's how the order's going to go. Remember, zip it. And we're going to walk around this city. And then you go back to your camp. This happens the first day. Happens the second day. Happens the third day. Do you think there was any temptation to grumble or murmur? Remember these guys in their heritage, I mean, their family roots, right? But the Bible says they do it. And every single day they followed the prescription that God had laid out for them. They didn't doubt Joshua. They didn't come to Joshua and say, Joshua, we don't think you heard God correctly when he spoke to you about what we're supposed to do. They don't do any of that. They just simply obeyed, and they did it through an enduring spirit. Now, how many times God says to us, I want you to walk by faith, and you're not always going to be rewarded for it immediately. Sometimes it's going to take time. Sometimes it's going to to require endurance on your part. Remember, Hebrews chapter 11 is followed by Hebrews chapter 12. And right in the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about running the race with what? Endurance. People of Israel had endurance. They ran this race, and they ran it by faith. On the seventh day, the Bible says they rose early at the dawning of the day, and they marched around the city in the same manner. They went around it seven times. And the Bible says in verse 15, at the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city shall be under the ban, and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. And so what happens on that seventh day is just as they said, they would shout, And then Joshua would go on and he would tell the people, there's a ban here on all of these things. He says, there's some things that are going to happen. The city is going to be under this ban and all that belongs inside that city belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her, her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban. So you don't covet them and take some of the things under the ban and make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it. But all the silver, the gold, and the articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They'll go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted. Must have been quite a time. The people of Israel all shouting. Can you imagine being inside Jericho and watching these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people walking around every single day one time, and then they go, and back to their camp they go. And all the while they're going around your city, they're not saying a word to each other. You know how freaky that would be if you were a Jerichoite? And then there's the seventh day, and you're expecting them to do one loop and go back and sit down. And you're sitting there to yourself saying, this is kind of entertaining. And instead, they keep going, and you're thinking, oh, this is interesting. And they keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going. And then they stop, and we have that loud trumpet. The trumpet was actually somewhat of significance as well. These trumpets were important because they were usually used for just a couple of different things. One of the things that they would be used for is for a signal to actually call to attention something. They weren't the kind of trumpets where you would, you know, play the Tijuana brass version of something, okay? There were no valves on this thing. None of that. It was just a... You get, I mean, that's my version, and um, I, I could be wrong, but, but these are big trumpets, and, and they let it out, and so it would signal. Oftentimes, it signaled things with regards to the festivals that the people of Israel had. It would signify the presence of God coming in among the people, or it could also be used in a military sense, and, and they would know whether or not they should charge, retreat, or take lunch, I, I'm, I, you know, but they used these signals, and they were very important. And here we are, they are blowing this signal on the day that the walls are going to come down. 
And I believe it's signifying, yes, that God is present there. That God was doing something that was totally spiritual and of great significance. And it was also a military sign. And all the people, when they hear those trumpets go, they've circled the city seven times, all shout. I don't know what they shouted. Might have been some kind of Hebraic expression. Might have just been, oh, or yay, or whatever, but it was loud. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people. If you watch some of those football games and they score a touchdown, you see the stadium just erupt and the loudness of it that goes off of the decibel chart. They're so excited. Whoo! What a time. Well, the Bible says that these walls come tumbling down. The people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets, and when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. Pretty exciting day, huh? We're there. We've been waiting for this for so long, and it's finally happened. Or did it? Or did it? Is Jericho really real? Or is this just some story that no one can prove, but it sounds good? The reality is that there have been excavations done in Jericho. The mound of rubble they would call a tell. There were some Germans who were there in 1907 who were doing some excavating followed by a man by the name of Garstang who came in the, I believe he was there in the 30s or 40s, followed by a woman by the name of Kathleen Kenyon in the 1950s. They identified this as actually the city of Jericho. For most of them, they are seeing the support from archaeology that, yes, Jericho is indeed real. It definitely did happen. It's kind of fascinating when you stop and you consider it because when Kathleen Kenyon did her work, her compilations weren't done until after she had actually passed away. But it's fascinating because her conclusion as she looked at this wall, I mean, we're, we're talking a wall 40-some feet high and, and meters thick. We're talking about walls within walls on the outer walls, and some of them were, were just uh, one course of brick that would be in the poorer section. As Kenyon did her work, she concluded that this could not be the biblical Jericho that fell. She did note that there was a three-foot swath of debris that has been burned. Remember, Joshua 6.24 says that the people of Israel burned the city. It was very common to burn the cities uh, because of the construction of the walls and the fact that most of them were built out of limestone. And out of that limestone, you could actually, through building a fire next to the wall, extract the uh, molecules of, of moisture inside of the, the limestone, and they would actually just crumble. You, say, you think to yourself, how do you burn something that's made out of stone? But that, that's how you do that. She looked at it and she said, there's something missing and because of that, I'm going to date this in a different time period than you would have the Jericho city crumbling. And so she's off by about 1,500 years, I think. She's looking for something that would put the destruction of Jericho, which happens... Um, B.C. 1400, she's looking at that and she's saying, well, okay, I, I'm not finding that. And her reasoning was due to her finding pottery that was middle bronze instead of late bronze. It's kind of a funny thing. And so she finds this, and this is the extensive work done on the excavating. So she says, no, middle bronze, we're talking 1550 versus 1400, so there's maybe two year, 200 years apart, and so this can't be the Jericho. And the church looked at that finding, and the church said, well, that's because when God destroys something, you never can find the evidence. And that was how we rolled with it. Now, I want to just tell you that if they never found this mound of dirt, my faith in God's word holds. I'm not, I don't really care. I, I mean, I don't lose sleep over it. I don't gain sleep over it, okay? 
But what was so fascinating was Kenyon never checked with Garstang, who was there 20 years earlier doing his excavating. Because when he was excavating, he found this pottery, and he didn't even know what it was. And she never checked it. But later on, as time has gone on, we know that Garstang found late bronze pottery, which was exactly the reason why Kenyon said, this can't be the biblical Jericho, because this pottery is older, and what she didn't understand was her dig was taking place in the poor section of the city. Isn't that fascinating? And so she's finding this stuff that's not late bronze. Everywhere else in the city, there's late bronze. It's been identified even though Garstang didn't know what it was. It's very fascinating to me because what all this points to very, very clearly is the fact that they have unearthed the actual Jericho. Here are some of the things that they found. On the north side of the city, in this poor section of the city, there is one area and only one area where the walls did not come falling down. I believe that belongs to uh, Rahab's household. It is exactly adjacent to the Judean hills, being off on that north side, where those men would have escaped and gone up into those hills for three days. Fascinating, isn't it? When the Bible says that the walls fell flat, literally the Hebrew says that they fell in on each other. They just just crumbled right there, just fell right in on each other. And this would be of interest and of note because there was a retaining wall all the way around Jericho that was some 12 to 15 feet high at places. Which means that even if the walls came from, uh, you know, falling down, how would the people who are attacking Jericho then, the Israelites, how would they get into the city? Well, what they found was that these walls fell perfectly. They fell, and they created perfect ramps. So when the Bible says that the people of Israel ran straight into the city, every single one of them that is encompassing this city didn't need to run anywhere but straight directly in because the entire city was accessible through these ramps. Isn't that fascinating? So there's where God is saying, wait a minute, this is what I'm doing. All of these things... I have accomplished, and the victory has been won. And we are, here we are in, in 19, six, or 2016, and we're looking, I was going to say 1916, um, but 2016, and we're looking at it, and we're saying to ourselves, wow, the evidence is very, very clear. It's happening, and it's happened just as the Bible said. Isn't that amazing? We should never doubt God's word, should we? We should never doubt They even found, remember I was just reading that section there on the ban. God says, I don't want you to touch any of this stuff. In fact, the silver, gold, and so forth, bronze and everything, that's mine. That's going into the treasury of God. So if you're an Israelite, you're going to be careful not to touch that stuff, right? You would think so. We'll get there next week. The people of Israel leave behind all kinds of other things. One of the things that Garstang and Kenyon both found were these huge quantities of grain. Remember the river is overflowing when the people of Israel cross over. It was part of the enhancement of that miracle and the terminology there is well, it was because of the time of the harvest and so these people had just harvested. In fact, if the people of Israel were to lay siege to Jericho, many think it would have taken years for them, years to be able to break through that siege. God does it in seven days. Actually, way less than that, it was the preparation that took most of the time. And most of that preparation, if you recall, is spiritual preparation. But there is God doing his miracle, and you have this grain that Kenyon finds in the 1900s. And grain is very significant. Oftentimes when they would, would, they would be doing archaeological digs, they would find small quantities, maybe a small jar of some grain. This was enormous quantities of grain. And remember that grain was oftentimes used as a monetary exchange. But the people of Israel left it behind. Fascinating, isn't it? They were blown away by that. You see, it all goes back to the scriptures just as God had told them. And it does nothing but build our faith. Jericho, if I can go all the way back to this map, was the obstacle that they come to that they couldn't bypass. 
People of Israel have come across this, the Jordan River, and they cannot bypass Jericho. It is a fortified city. It had to be taken out of the way. You couldn't conquer the rest of the land without dealing with Jericho. But everything that God has done has been spiritual in nature. This great fortress, this great enormous city is taken not by physical means, but by spiritual means. They simply follow God's direction and his power is evidenced around them. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive, making obedient to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Tearing down these strongholds. How we approach our spiritual life needs to be through spiritual means. We're not going to be what God wants us to be by trying to employ physical means. These strongholds that have elevated themselves against God must be pulled down. And the only way in which they will be pulled down is through the application of God's truth. But understand this, that God's word is always capable of tearing down those strongholds. You and I may have Jerichos in our life. And if I may make this application, we all have barriers to where God wants us to be. For the people of Israel, that barrier is Jericho. You need to go through Jericho, you need to deal with Jericho, and all of us have barriers to where we need to be spiritually. We can't overcome those barriers by physical means. You can go to the Christian bookstore, you can buy the biggest Bible they sell there, like the real honking coffee table version. And here's what's so amazing. It won't make you any more spiritual than the pocket-sized edition. The reality is we don't fight a battle with flesh and blood, but this is a battle that is raging, and it's a spiritual conflict. What are the barriers? What are the Jerichos in your life that keep you from accomplishing the things that God wants you to accomplish? I would submit to you today that we all have those barriers, every one of us. We all have those issues. We all have things that keep us from being what God wants us to be. Remember when Jesus was talking about the church, he said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not, what? Prevail against it. When Jesus talks about the gates of hell, it's an interesting terminology, but I remember our our professor, when we were in Israel, pointing out the fact that when you walk through the entrance point to the city, there were rooms on either side most frequently. And it was all known, that entering point and those rooms were all known as the gate of the city. And it's within those rooms where the selectmen, the mayor, the grand poobah, whoever, that ran the city, that's where the minds of the city would meet. That's where the judges would meet to extract justice and God is saying that the gates the schemes the methodologies the plans of Satan all his conspirings in that the gates of hell he says will not prevail against my church you see we have the victory and the victory's already been won He's telling us that. He's told us that in the New Testament, that when it comes to the struggles of our flesh, he says the victory is there. It's like it's already accomplished. Jesus Christ won the victory over sin and death and hell. 
And now you and I, as we journey in our spiritual lives, we will come into conflict with these, these barriers, these Jerichos, and what we're going to so badly need is to follow the Lord and enact the same type of spiritual warfare that's been used previously. We need to walk by that faith. We need to be enduring. We need to stop and we need to listen and hear from God so that we are listening to what God wants us to do and then by faith journeying through that and staying with it until the victory is won. For this is the sequence here in Joshua chapter 6 that so stands out. Well, Joshua is full of some amazing things. In verse 25, it tells us Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. And she's lived in the midst of Israel to this day, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. We find that God is a faithful God, and he's watching out. It's amazing when you look at what God has done and realize that God has always been faithful. I need to know God is faithful. I need to know that if I'm going to rush up against Jericho, if I'm going to expect the victory, if I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight, I need to know that my God is faithful, amen? I need to know that. And I go back to a passage like this and I see that indeed God is faithful. God made a promise to a harlot back in chapter 2 and Joshua is sticking with God's promise and she has been spared. And the whole city comes down and the whole city crumbles under itself. And I'm sure when that happens, these warriors who are on the walls have perished. It is an amazing day of victory. But as this city falls down, isn't it amazing that one little spot of that city stands, allowing her life to be spared? My friends, if God cares about this woman and her family, I know that God is faithful towards me and faithful towards you. That the promises that he's made in the New Testament are worthy of following and latching hold of because they are just as real for us today as the promises throughout the ages have ever been. In conclusion, let me read the last couple verses here of Joshua chapter 6. You'll notice that it says, Joshua made them take an oath at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds this city Jericho with the loss of his firstborn, he'll lay its foundation. And with the loss of the youngest son, he'll set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. Whew. Now that's a prediction. That's a curse, isn't it? Look at this. First Kings chapter 16. Ahab, you remember Ahab? Ahab was a stellar dude, wasn't he? He was just a wonderful man. He was a king of Israel to the north. What a great man. He married a woman. I think her name was, um, she, her, her father was the Sidonians. Jezebel, that's it, that's it. Jezebel's not a girl's name that comes to mind very often. You know what I mean? For obvious reasons. But he decided he was going to rebuild Jericho. In his day, it says uh, that he tried to do that. He laid its foundations with the loss of a Byram his firstborn, and he set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, just according to the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua. Isn't that amazing? Friends, listen, God is a God. He's righteous and holy. He makes these promises. There's the promise of of deliverance that Rahab realizes when the walls come tumbling down. What a time. I can't emphasize this enough. Can you imagine being Rahab and her family and listening to the shout of the Israelites that could have shaken the doors because there are so many of them around your city and to realize that this city is crumbling. It is falling down and yet everything falls and she's still standing there. God is a faithful God. Do you realize that God has made a promise that if we place our faith in Jesus Christ, believe on his name, we'll have everlasting life. 
our sins will be forgiven. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our God is a faithful God. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that comes to me will never perish, but have everlasting life. What a blessing it is. Our God has made some wonderful, wonderful promises. But also understand this, that on the other side of it, God has also cautioned the world. Because without faith in Christ, there is a place called hell that's just as real. God said, listen, there's a curse. Don't build this city again. If you try to build this city, when you build the foundation, it's going to cost you your firstborn. And if you hang that gate so that you can finally go in, it'll cost you your youngest one. And here we are later with Ahab testing God and finding out that God is true in all that he says. And so your choice and my choice today revolves around a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because he is the only way that we can have eternal life. For the same God who made these promises that have come to pass in the Old Testament has made these promises in the new. Will you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and know that you are saved today? that your sin has been forgiven? Will you come to him and place your faith in him knowing that there's no other means for salvation except through Jesus Christ? Or will you seek to do it your own way and take your chances? A very, very dangerous decision to make. But God has given to us a will to decide what will you do with Jesus? Same faithful God in the Old Testament is the faithful God in the New. And he calls us to make that decision. I trust that today you know the faithfulness of God. That you're clinging on to his promises. And I trust that this passage of scripture does nothing less than get you excited about your relationship with Christ. Because you know that God is a faithful God. And all the things that he's laid out in his word, reading through the New Testament, you see how God is faithful to do all those things that he has said he would do. We have a great God. It is a pleasure to know him and follow him and walk daily with him. Let's pray. Perhaps you're here this morning and Maybe you're just a little amazed at the working of God. And you realize that God is truly true to his word. Maybe that's caused you to think a bit this morning. I trust that if you're here and you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that you'll be inspired to go on and live by faith and walk by faith. That you'll take the time to be quiet and listen to what God has to say to you and Upon hearing his word, you'll follow it by faith. And even if it requires some endurance and patience on your part, you're still committed to do that. I, I trust that that will be the takeaway from the service this morning for you. But if you're here today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have a decision to make. There are a lot of things you can put your faith in. There are many people who place their faith in works. There are many people who place their faith in religion. Um, there are many people who have multiplicity of, of things that they are trusting will gain them entrance into the kingdom of heaven. But my friends, if the Bible is true, which I believe it to be, and I think Jericho is a great example of this, then the Bible tells us that there's one way to go into the presence of the Lord for eternity, and that is through Jesus Christ. Placing our faith and trust in him, acknowledging that he is truly God himself who took on flesh, leading eventually to the cross where he gave his life for all of us. That we might, through faith in him, have eternal life. I wonder, we're going to have a word of prayer here in just a second, but I wonder if you're here today and you say, Pastor Kevin, I'm thinking this through and trying to determine 
where my faith is. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe you are ready. Maybe today you're saying, Lord, save me. That'd be awesome. But you would say, Pastor Kevin, would you please pray for me today? God's speaking in my heart. Is there anyone at all? Just slip up your hand with our heads bowed. Won't embarrass you in any way, but God's speaking in my heart about where I'm going to spend my eternity. Just slip up your hand that I can pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you all stand as we have a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, you are a merciful God, a good God, a God who is good all the time. We are a blessed people because we hear the truth. We hear of your plan of redemption, and we rejoice, Lord, in your love toward us. Be with those, Father, today who've indicated that God is moving in their heart, wherever they are in their thought processes and the decision, Lord, uh, how I pray that your spirit would minister marvelously in their heart and life, giving them clarity and assurance to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and have the knowledge and understanding that their sins have been paid for fully. Work in all of our hearts, I pray today, Father. Help us to rely on your goodness, but help us this week, Lord, in the midst of an oncoming holiday season that can extract more and more from all of us. Lord, how I pray that we would be quiet before you. Help us, Father, to spend time to be quiet. Help us, Lord, to stop and listen to what you speak to us about. Help us, Lord, to spend time in your word so that you can speak to our hearts. Help us, Father, not to get too busy that we ignore you. And then, Father, upon learning those things you're directing us towards, Father, give us the strength to truly, Lord, walk by faith. And help us, Father, to endure if that's what's required knowing, Lord, that you're always faithful to complete what you've started in our lives. Bless us this week, Lord. Help us to be great ambassadors for Jesus Christ, Lord. And when we, when we stumble, Father, help us to get up and, and keep going. We love you, Lord. We want to be what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.